Hi, I'm Carl Taylor. Welcome to Carl Taylor Live on social media. Which social media channels are we on, Ashley? Facebook, YouTube, nothing yeah, else, I, I hope. I think that's it. I think that's it. So, as again, like last time, you've done this once now already, haven't you? Almost an old hand. <laughs> Almost an old hand. Ashley's here with me. Ashley works here at Carl Taylor Education as my assistant on photo shoots, as well as many other things that you do in this organisation. So, she's going to be helping me with the questions that are coming in. So, we're doing... Yes our usual live Q&A. We are, yes. And we're going to take your questions, photography related questions, obviously. And um, we'll take those a little bit later. Um, but first, we've got a number of things to talk about, haven't we? Um, the you. first thing I want to talk about is you wrote a really good blog post regarding the um, anniversary of the um, 50th anniversary of the Apollo moon landing. Yes, with the Hasselblad cameras going up, getting yes. some of our first pictures of yes. actual people on the moon. And did you enjoy writing that blog post? I actually did. I knew nothing about it, really. I mean, obviously, it was a little bit before before I was born. So. You know, it was the year I was born, actually. It was, yes. <laughs> <laughs> now everybody knows I, how old you are. <laughs> I probably watched it when I was a little baby, you see. So my parents probably made me watch it. Um, but yeah, 50 years ago, NASA went to the moon. Now, some people don't believe they went to the moon, do they? Some they people, <laughs> conspiracy theorists and all this. Now, this is interesting because we have Hasselblad coming to our studio on one of our live shows on the 18th of July. The 18th of July, yep. yeah. They're coming in here on our talk show, on the sofa, guests, and uh, their technical expert, uh, Chris Coos, is coming in to talk about the Apollo moon missions, what was involved, uh, how uh, Hasselblad got involved in that space program and shooting, uh, setting up the cameras to work in those conditions. What was the temperature on the moon? I believe it was minus 173 degrees Celsius. Minus 173 <laughs> Celsius is the temperature. Uh, they had to make sure these cameras could work in all these conditions, in the, in the cold, in the, the, the dusty environment, whatever, low gravity, various aspects. There were different things to do with... Um, you know, the weight of the cameras and what they could transport, what they could yeah, take. Yeah, the cameras, from what I understand, were basically stripped of any unnecessary mechanism. They were right, just, down just keep the their... weight down, yeah. yeah. Now, uh, Chris is going to bring one of the cameras, he's bringing one of the Apollo moon cameras with him here to Carl Taylor Education, live on our talk show, 18th of July, not to be missed. No. Now, if you are going to miss it, well, actually, even if you're going to watch it... If you are going to miss it... Why? Yeah, why? <laughs> but if you are going to see it, there's something that uh, you've put here, haven't you? This. Yes. This is great. This is on our blog. Now, if you want to go to our blog, we've got loads of great free tips on our blog. It's over here in the article section under inspiration. This is a blog post that Ashley's put together um, about the um, Apollo moon missions and everything that was involved. Now, what's really interesting with this, we, we, we talk a little bit about the history of the cameras, how they made the cameras work, how they got to be involved in the uh, moon missions. But also, um, we started to pull in a little bit of this stuff on the moon landing conspiracy theories. Uh, and, and you've pulled up some questions about some of the images that people questioned. They thought it was fake because of this and because of that. And we've actually answered the reasons that it isn't fake. And Hasselblad are going to answer those reasons in depth when they're here as well and all of the work that went into the moon mission. So there's a whole bunch of stuff here on the blog that details uh, some of the conspiracy theories and some of the other stuff. And we've also got a small section on how to photograph the moon, how you can photograph the moon. Yeah. And why is that? Why? Why can you photograph the moon? Because we tell you how. <laughs> exactly. We tell you how. That's, that's just a, a short section that we actually decided to put into a whole separate bro uh, blog. So that's got just that, a link to that And that's, that's, that's going to be there sooner. There. And, and we've made a video, haven't we? We have. The video isn't up yet. When's it going up? Ben's working furiously. So furiously? Whenever, is it, <laughs> when, when's furiously? Is it coming up this week or next week? I think it's next week, is it? It's it being might released be next, next week, yeah. yeah. Next week, we're, we're releasing on YouTube. Uh, and uh, Facebook as well, a video on how you can photograph the moon and the results that you can get. And actually, let's take a look. Well, there's one I shot there. That picture that you can see on screen now is one I shot from uh, my back garden, if I remember correctly, it was some time ago. As a matter of fact, let me, um, let me just find a, a, a shot here. Uh, so I've got a couple of shots here. I mean, this is, this is how simple it is to do. Um, look, you can you can get your own moon shots quite easily. Look, look at all the craters that I managed to reveal 
in this shot, the mountains on the moon, the craters and everything. So to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Apollo moon, landing, moon landings, we decided to make a video on how you can photograph the moon. We're going to be releasing that free video on YouTube, shows you what settings on your camera, what lens recommendations, tripod, etc., how to do it, what to look out for, boom, 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 nice and easy. That will be posted on our um, social media channels soon. So take a look out for that and definitely take a look out for Ashley's blog post because you put an awful lot of work into this blog post, haven't you? Tons and tons of stuff and information uh, about conspiracy theories, about the technology, about the science behind it, all of that. Very impressive blog post, well worth the read and well worth checking out our show live on Carl Taylor Education on the 18th of July. So. Put that one in your diary, I would say. What else have we got coming? We're going to take, we're going to take some questions very We've soon. We've got a few questions already coming in. We've got questions coming in, yeah. coming in mm. already. Um, but before we do that, we're just going to talk about um, our next uh, thing that we've got coming up. No, no. Oh, the, the whole reason of this show today is to announce our competition winners. We have our photography competition which was titled beautiful light beautiful yeah. light so pictures to do with beautiful light uh, so obviously it had to be a competent image uh, a quality photograph but the main uh, takeaway from it was that the image had to consist of beautiful light and first prize was it was a is very exciting a very exciting cirrus lighting dun, kit dun, dun, <laughs> a brand new bronze color cirrus lighting kit look at this two amazing cirrus lighting heads Look at this stuff here. This is a very expensive kit. This is lovely. And uh, it comes in this lovely kit bag. I think it comes with a couple of umbrellas and yeah. bits and bobs, accessories. I think it's valued at like three or four thousand dollars. Three or four thousand dollars value. Nice we don't cut corners here, do we? No. For we 14, for however many pounds per 14 month? Pounds 14 pounds a month, 19 dollars a month, month <laughs> to be a member. <laughs> um, we've, given, we've given away a few of these now. We've given away 5D Mark III cameras. We've given away all sorts of stuff. Uh, that's the first prize. Second prize is this, isn't it? Yep. What is that? A big stopper by Lee Filters. Yep. Yep. So that's and we have my own Carl Taylor Lee Filter lighting gel packs for studio lighting is third prize. We're going to be announcing the winners right here very shortly. We're going to look at some of the winning images. We're going to look at some of the shortlist images and then we're going to announce the top three winners in that. Um, that's coming up soon as well as our Q&A. Now, uh, before we move on, I want to talk about this. Um, where is it? No, not that. Uh, no, competitions, right. So first of all, here is our next competition in September. The theme is technology. Closing date, 27th of September. And then, um, oh, that's June 2019. There's another one after that, which I think may be another Cirrus lighting kit, or it may be a 5D Mark III. I'm not quite sure. So uh, we've got all of that coming up. I think before we move on, before we do the competition and before we talk about that amazing Clinique advertising shot, Keep should, we, them waiting. should we take a couple of questions? <laughs> yeah, Go we on, can. Go on, fire away. <laughs> okay, the first question is from Malai Usa, I think. Sorry if I got that wrong. Saying, hi, Carl Taylor. Um, are you considering interpreting our photo? So I don't know if that's someone who's entered our competition. Um, well, if, if you mean like a critique, so we do the critiques quite regularly on Carl Taylor uh, Education, where I critique members' work, they submit their pictures, and we do this massive critique. It Normally, uh, we, we do it on topic, don't we? Like product photography, portrait, yes. fashion, yeah. beauty, and we do different topics throughout the year, and then I critique members' work. We don't generally critique for the competitions, uh, but we may well do a critique um, on the competition. The problem is with the competitions, we get so, so many entries. I think we had over 300 yeah, entries so in total a, for this a one, lot yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of entries in on this one, and um, I think it would take us too long to critique them. So uh, all we're going to do is look at the shortlisted ones today and, and have a little brief chat on that. What we got okay. next? Next one is from Brian I'm glad. I'm glad you're the one pronouncing these names, not me, that's for sure. Saying, um, hi, I want to start taking pictures of food. I'm a beginner in food photography. What would you recommend? Well, food photography can be quite simple and it can be quite complex. You can start really simple with just, you know, a simple octobox or even natural light from a window. Yeah. 
Uh, we've actually got some courses on cooking, home cooking food photography coming out in a month or so. Yeah, they're being released. And, and those just use very, nat you know, some simple natural light techniques and we compare natural light to simple uh, artificial light as well. Yeah, they were shot in someone's kitchen, so it really, yeah, so there was nothing fancy Exactly, involved. yeah, we didn't it even do just, them here. We yeah. went to a home and shot them in someone's home. Um, and we teach those techniques and then we've already got a ton of courses as well. But I can tell you now, was it Brian? I can tell you now, Brian, yes. uh, a, a single large softbox, like a big Octobox 150 or a large window is a good way to get started. Kind of backlight, three quarter backlight your food shots, then use a mirror or reflector to help bounce mm -hmm. a little bit of light in. Now it can get a lot more complex than that. Um, you know, over on our, on our courses here, if we look at product photography, you can see actually on the drop down menu, we've got a whole section on food photography. And we've got food stylist Anna, Anna Pushtonikova here. We've got all these new food courses coming out. We've, got, we've actually got a ton of food photography <laughs> courses now, an absolute ton of them. So we've got a ton of stuff over on Carl Taylor Education. £14, $19 a month, you get access to everything. Next question. Next one is from Wood Studio saying, hi, both of you. Can That's you as well. I know. Wow. <laughs> That's why I thought I'd throw it in there. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell me how to make the final price for a short video advert? How to make the final so price? So maybe they're quoting a client or something, trying to reach a... Well, I mean, it, you know, we charge our work based on our day rate. So you have to have a day rate or what we call a creative fee. So. The photographer's day rate or a videographer's day rate is largely dependent on their skill set, their facilities, the studio, the level of their service, the quality of their work. Um, and, you know, th these, this can be a huge varying range, but you, you have to have a rate. So whatever your day rate is, multiplied by the amount of days it's going to take you to produce that video. And then normally as well, most photographers will have a day rate for the actual creative filming work and then they'll have maybe a slightly different rate for post-production. Yeah. So video editing or for Photoshop post-production, that type of thing. So you combine the total shooting time and the total post time, work out your day rates for both, multiply it, they give you the price that you should be charging. Don't undersell yourself. Um, you know, stick to, you know, don't, don't think, oh, it's going to take me three days, but I can't, you know, you've got to charge what, what, what you're worth. Um, but what you're worth is also dependent on your work. So, you know, it's a simple work it out by how much, how long it's going to take and what your day fee is, basically. Next one is from Manu Messier. Is the article about the 50th anniversary landing on your blog? It is. Yes. Now, Manu, Manu actually, he won. I think he won the Cirrus Good Lighting winner. Kit. He was, I rec yeah. recognise his name as one of our previous uh, winners. Um, and Manu is, um, he's, he's a very skilled... Um, Astro photographer. He does a lot. Okay. Of, he, he's, he's based down in France. I think so he, he came on. Interested. He came on one of our workshops once as well, and um, he would be very interested in it. Yes, the 50th anniversary article is on our blog, Manu, which is in the article section. It's also here. on uh, the live show page as well. You can link to it directly oh, from oh. our future. All right, live so it's shows. on our live shows page mm -hmm. as well, which you can find here. And uh, obviously, they Hasselblad will be here with one of the moon cameras in our studio on the 18th of July for uh, Carl Taylor Education live show. Next one. Someone relating to that, Rick Mentor, is saying you can't wait to see the Hasselblad moon camera. Um, maybe, by the way, would they have a price for the CFV50 digital back? Well, he's bringing one of those as well. So he should. So he's bringing. I think he's bringing the new X1D2. I think he's bringing the new CFV, possibly a prototype or something else. Um, but he's going to tell me some stuff because apparently, no one knows this, but there's something else that's going to be released before he comes. So we'll have... And we'll have first shout at it. <laughs> so he's there going to go. bring that as well. So that, that 18th of July, guys, make sure you're here. Carl Taylor Education Live Shows. We're going to have a whole great bunch of stuff on that night. I'm, I'm looking, looking forward, forward to it. It's yeah, going to be a, yeah. a gear fest night. I think it's going to be really is, interesting. Yeah. Something is slightly different as well. So that's Absolutely. Cool. The Amped Life with Chris is saying, Hi, Carl. Not saying hi to me. I'm off to <laughs> photograph <laughs> Canyonlands National Park in Utah. I have space for two Canon lenses in my kit. Can you please suggest which two will be the most useful? Oh, it's Chris from South Africa, though. Hi, oh, Chris. is he from South Africa, <laughs> he is. is he? And he didn't say hello to you? No. Oh, my goodness. Right. Um, I would say, Chris, that um, if it was it a Canon 35mm frame? He didn't specify. Let's assume it's a 35mm yeah. full-frame camera. My first choice lens would be the 16-35 to 2.8, along with a bunch of, like, Lee filters, um, you know, foundation kit with graduated filters and 
polarizers or ND filters so that we can get some movement in the sky. That, the 16 to 35 would be my choice. Then after that, I'd be thinking even about a 50 mil lens for you know detail shots in the landscape as mm -hmm. well. Telephoto stuff doesn't really cut it for me for landscape, but I think 16 to 35 and maybe a 50 mil prime would be my couple of choices. Okay. Cool. Then Stephen Pegg is saying, hi, Carl, what would you recommend for product photography? Soft boxes or synchronized flashes? Uh, neither, actually. Wouldn't recommend either of those for product photography. Uh, if, if, Stephen, you were on our education platform, you would understand why you need to use gradient lighting for most product photography. It's a very specific lighting technique. It involves spreading the light out in a way that the softbox doesn't because softbox is homogenous. I mean, we can, you can use softboxes for some products if they're matte finished uh, products, but most product photography is glossy, shiny, plastic, gloss, glass, metals, and gradient lighting is what we use for, for all of that. I mean, if we just take a look at some of my commercial work here, um, all of the sort of lighting we're talking about, like this lighting here, this is gradient lighting on, uh, on my product stuff. If we look at um, nearly every sort of high quality product shoot that I do, it's got some form of gradient lighting on the products. Look at this boss advert. Look, this is all gradient lighting on these products. Soft boxes just wouldn't look that good on this stuff. Um, now, I can tell you now, to, to create gradient lighting, you need a scrim, you need a very specific type of scrim, you need to use it in a certain way, you need to understand lighting, and you can use soft boxes behind the scrim, but that's not how it's done. Um, I'm, I could, you know, we've got probably a hundred plus hours of product photography tutorials oh, yeah. on Carl mm. Taylor Education. Go and watch the lot for $19. There you go. Next one. Okay, next question is from Justin Picari, Picari. Picari, I think, yeah. I've been working on improving my product photography. That's the reason they're here. And after watching your wine and liquor videos, the biggest challenge I have is enough width in my studio space to get the 216 and lights back far enough to get soft light around the bottles. Oh, Any advice? I beg to differ. Um, look at that one we did for um, the Grapevine Wine Company. We did that in that tiny space. Oh, true. Yes, yeah, yeah. And that's that a was, video I mean, on that, YouTube. That was probably that, just much, about yeah, bigger than this desk, bigger really. than this table, yeah. Um, that video is on YouTube, isn't it? It is, it yes. Is. So and there's, there's actually a lighting diagram and everything on our blog post as well. Okay, so there's a yeah. blog post on our website about it where we had to set up a mini studio for a client that runs a wine company and we built a studio for them that they didn't have to move anything so they could just shoot pack shots of wine mm -hmm. over and over and again, very repeatable. That's a video on our YouTube channel if you search for it, if you're concerned about working in a small space. And like you say, there's also a blog post to do with it as yeah. well. I mean, obviously the more space you've got, the better. The, the thing you'll find in small studios, you can get a lot of bounce, light bouncing around. So it, I recommend going with um, uh, a darker, a studio you can pull black curtains around so you don't get light bounce, you can, can control like you, your light. They painted the ceiling in They painted in that there, ceiling they, black, yeah, didn't they? We asked, that. we told mm. them to paint their ceiling black in that one so they didn't get extra light bouncing around where we didn't want it. Because you can always put a poly board up or something if you want to bounce some light off, but mm -hmm. if you've got a big white ceiling and it's low and you've got white walls and it's all too small, you can't control your light properly. Yeah. So there's always a good tip for small studios is maybe put a draw curtain around the walls that you can pull a black fabric around the walls if you need to darken the studio out. Okay, next one. Next one is from Michael A. Triolo. I'm going to photograph a web page of men's underwear. I wonder if a single front large softbox is the best lighting. Well, it depends. Is the men's underwear on a men or is it on a mannequin or is it just lying on a table? Let's assume it's on a mannequin. Um, I, I, it would certainly look more attractive because it's, you go shape and form rather than a pair of pants lying on a table is never going yeah. to be that good. Um, I wouldn't, you know, everyone makes the mistake with most photography generally is they light Say, say we're the subject. They light us from the front like this, from the front. Front lighting is flat lighting, okay? You really get the best lighting in product photography when you bring that lighting around to the side and then you get some contouring. But then the shadow side can be too dark. A bit like what we've got going on here. Look, you see the side of my face here? This is the shadow side, right? Now watch this with this. Look, look, watch this shadow side fill in, look. See that? Look. See that shadow side can be controlled 
how strong that shadow side is just with a simple reflector card. So we can have contouring and we can have shape by having the light round to the side slightly, then either bringing in another light or just bringing in a reflector. Mm. Most of my product work is contouring light from sides and yeah. from back with a little bit of fill as well in there. Now, let's, let's just pause on the questions a moment yeah. while we're on the subject of product photography and how we light it. Take a look at this shot here, okay? This, by the way, is my Squarespace website, right? Mm -hmm. This is the Wells template Squarespace website, and I just want to say thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring this episode. Make great website templates, just like the one that I use here. Uh, as I said, the Wells template that I've used. I've used this for years. I love the fact that I can update my website instantly. I've got all my different subcategories. I've got all my sub menus here. Uh, and it's just so versatile because I can just update stuff really, really quickly on, uh, on my website uh, very, very easily. Now, if you want to get your own Squarespace website, Use the offer code CARL, K-A-R-L, not C-A-R-L. Whoever's called CARL with a C is not proper CARL. Just as well, we're not doing right? one for my name. Can yeah. you imagine? Yeah, your name's spelled weirdly <laughs> as well, Ashley. I thought Ashley was a boy's name until I met you, but there we go. Yeah. Anyway, right, so CARL with a K, offer code CARL. When you check out, you get two weeks free trial on your Squarespace website first. And then if you decide you want to go with it, use the offer code Carl, you get a 10% discount. And then you can get yourself a great website just like this one here, okay? Now, anyway, went off topic there a little bit. Let's go here, back to my photo. This is a, a, an, a Clinique advertising image, style image. And the really important factors in this image to consider are all of the elements about, you know, what makes a Clinique style adv advertising style image. You know, they're all about invigorating freshness. They're about this purity, clarity. They always go with these white backgrounds. The, the lighting on the product has to be very defined, this lovely glow coming through the product, the silkiness on this product, the type of splash, everything. Now, we worked on that shot together, didn't we? Yeah. And it took about Frickin a day and a half. Yeah. A day and a half to <laughs> took do. A, it took a while and to do. And there's a lot of, lot of stuff involved in doing a shoot like that to nail it to that exact you know advertising style yeah, yeah, brief. You, you look at that and you don't really realize the amount of work that actually went into it absolutely mm. yeah, other they, than the splash you might yeah. think oh we threw a few splashes we flew, but there was a we, lot we, we flew a lot of splash, the splashes but it's a lot more than just the splash shot now the interesting thing about that is a lot of people think about product for product photography when we're talking about product photography they think it's you know just about nice images now it is about nice images but it's got it's more important than that it's about the message that the image delivers and the emotion that it invokes because there is a very particular type of brand styling with clinique that means most of their adverts look like that for example they look like that and they don't look like that this also has water and liquid Mm -hmm. But that would never, ever be a clean no, bottle in no. there, in that shot. It just, it's not on brand, okay? That's on brand for them. Nothing else is. Now, why, why are the reasons for that? This is fundamental stuff to understand with product photography and advertising photography. And we go into that, don't we, on the new course. So we've got the yeah. new course on that shoot, which um, actually is here, look, it's here, coming soon. It's coming very, very soon. How soon is it coming? This week, kind of soon. This week, so this <laughs> course here, you click on it here. Um, I'm just clicking on it. This course doesn't have a poster frame yet, that'll be in there soon. That course is coming very, very soon. I don't know why it jumped out of there onto me, I must have clicked the wrong button. So that course is coming, and um, we're going to be uh, detailing everything, not only, but, but the, the, the shooting techniques, but all of that stuff we just spoke about, about the branding and the stylization and the reasons why, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So look out for that coming soon. Right, let's take some more questions. Okay, we have the next question from F Frederick Pettipa, uh -huh. if that's how you say it. How to fight the temptation of using an ultra wide angle lens for landscape? Well, by ultra wide angle, the temptation is often to go with 16 mil because it's you know one of the widest angles that keeps a full frame. And I find it puts a little bit too much distortion in it. And the best way of avoiding the temptation is to go out with a fixed 24 mil lens. So quite often I use a 24 mil lens, fixed, fixed prime lens. Then you ain't got a choice. That's then, very true. Then all you can <laughs> shoot with is that 24 mil fixed lens and you have to move your body more. 
you move around with the camera to find the composition. Zoom lenses make you a little bit lazy, zooming in and out. You think, oh, I'm not gonna move my feet, I'll just zoom. But if you've got a fixed focal length lens, and this is the same for product photography as well, yeah. fixed focal length lens makes you move around, discover the angle, find the best position, and then you nail the shot. Zoom lenses can make you a bit, a bit sloppy sometimes. You mentioned a, like a fixed 24 mil, even a 50 mil would be, like you said earlier, uh, to, I think it was yeah, detail, Chris detail saying, shots. just uh, for landscapes, 50 mils are also Yeah, I mean, it's a, little bit, it's a little bit too towards the telephoto length for most landscapes, but you can find nice details in mm. the landscape with a 50 mil lens. Again, we've got a video on YouTube about um, shooting landscapes with a 50 mil lens. That's out there somewhere. Yeah. Next question. From Abhishek Bahara. Hello, sir. Does your online course have interior photography classes? I want to learn interior photography using lights and editing them. Um, yes, we've got a couple in our advanced section where we've done some sort of architectural interiors, but we have got a really good live show yes. with Sean Conboy, who's a top architectural photographer. He was a guest on our live show, and he talks about his techniques on how he lights his shots, how he shoots his shots, shows loads of great examples. He shoots all the big hotels around mm. the world and posh cruise ships and all sorts of stuff. So, uh, yeah, there's some stuff on there, and um, we're always adding new courses. We had two new courses per month, plus we had two live shows shows per month so we're always getting um, requests from our members and we're always trying to you know produce new material that our members want so we're you know it's never ending never ending yeah next one is from Peter C saying hello from sunny Athens in Greece Carl hello. what direction do you believe the photography profession is going can a photographer support himself doing only commercial work weddings a bit of everything well, I think they can. I mean, obviously, evidence is out there that some photographers are doing well. I think the market is a lot tougher than it was. Um, more people wanted to be photographers in the last 10 years than ever before, you know, with the advent of digital. But there are photographers that do really well. I mean, I'm, you know, we're now obviously in the education business, but I'd still be running a successful photography business if I wasn't doing the education, but I wouldn't have eight of you lot working with no. me. I'd just be me and you probably, or me and someone else, and that would be it. Just, that would be all I need to run my commercial photography business. Um, but, you know, wedding photographers like David Stanbury, very successful, travels all over the world shooting weddings, him and his wife, Jane, and... Um, they're busy. They're and shooting. They're, they're only doing yeah. wedding Sean photography. Sean Conboy, who we just spoke yeah, about, just does, does architectural architecture. photography. But these are successful people that have worked their way up, top of their game, top quality work. Like anything, your work's got to be good. You know, yeah. um, there is there is this this the, one of the, the problems with photography is unlike dentistry or car mechanics. You know, it's it's all subjective, isn't it? Is your work good? Is it all like someone someone else said my work is good, or someone else said, thinks it's good, or this, that, and the other? But does the market think your work is good? That's the key thing. You know, mm -hmm. don't take your best friend's dog's advice on whether or not the work is good. Does the market think your work is good? Does your work stand up to the other photographers that are out there? If it doesn't, and in your area is just a swathe of amazing photographers then supply and demand means you're probably not going to make a living. But if your work is really good and your prices are as competitive as anyone else and you're on the ball with your marketing, then like any other business, there's no reason why you can't make it work. Um, it, it is a question of supply and demand and how good you are and competition and all that stuff, which I can't answer, I'm afraid. Next one is from Goodfella saying, Hi, Carl and Lady. Have you gotten your hands lady. already? I'm yeah, lady. <laughs> thought that might come up. <laughs> Have you gotten your hands already on the new Hasselblad X1D Mark II? The price is amazing compared to the first one. Well, we haven't got our hands on one yet, but Chris Coos, who's coming over to do the talk show uh, from Hasselblad about the Apollo moon missions, is bringing one with him, as well as the CF feedback and some other new released item as well, which um, we can't talk about. Uh, the reason I can't talk about it is because I don't even know what it Maybe is. Maybe that's a good thing. <laughs> don't ruin the surprise. <laughs> Um, so he's going to be. So we will have one in our hands in a couple of weeks' time. Next question is from MM Shaggy. With the per side meteor shower about to happen in North America, mm. do you have a recommended lens to capture it? Um, no, I, I mean, you, you, it depends the field of view. 
the end of the day, all lenses have a field of view, an angle of view, their horizontal angle of view. Now, if you're pointing up at the night sky, you don't want a 100 millimeter lens with an angle of view like that, because you're not gonna get much stuff happening in that angle of view. You don't want a fisheye with a 180, mil, uh, 180 degree angle of view, might look a bit too distorted. So you're gonna have to think of your angle of view. These things are just gonna show up as light trail streaks across the sky. One thing I can tell you, and I've seen these sort of shots of meteor showers and all that stuff, I find them a bit boring. Most people point their camera at the sky, lock the shutter open for half an hour when all the main action's going. You just end up with a picture of a bunch of streaks and then your shutter's been open for half an hour, so the other stars have moved and started to blur. I always want to try and make something more of the picture. Get a tree mm -hmm. silhouetted. Get, get, you know, not a building because it'd be lit up and you get light, but, but find something to add something else in the picture. Yeah. You know, it could look really cool if you had a bit of a tree and branches and then you could see some of the meteorites going between the it, gaps. Yeah. And the, you know, there's things like that. Think a little bit more outside the box. But if you're not sure, find out from some astronomical site, what is the expected field of view where this thing's gonna happen in the sky? Is it the whole sky, is it a bit? And then try and choose the lens based on the angle of view to match. Next question is from S. Kanjilal. Hello mm -hmm. to you both. I am from Hyder, uh, uh, somewhere in India, Hyderabad. <laughs> uh, where is it? Point to that, you see? Hyderabad. Yeah, I don't know what Haven't that is. Haven't heard of that, I'm afraid. Know. What type of light do you recommend for an on-site food photographer? Flash or a continuous light and what power in general? I wouldn't recommend continuous light for food photography, especially when you get into the realms of cold foods, ice cream, stuff like that. It just melts stuff. I mean, yeah. LED stuff can be... Um, cold lighting as it's not doesn't get too hot but it's harder to modify led lighting so for me i prefer flash because pop bang you've got more power um, you need a modeling light to see what you're doing um, you can also use natural daylight but I, we mentioned earlier in the show you know a large soft box large mm -hmm. diffused light at a back 45 degree angle is a good place to start cool Jordan Photography is saying, hi Carl, I'm 17 and want to start doing some small photography work. Where do I start? Well, most people kick off with portraits and weddings. Um, you know, the, if you take the path of any most professional photographers, it starts off as a hobby or a university degree. It moves into doing some portraiture of people. Then maybe they'll try weddings. Weddings is always the, usually the first route in the door on the commercial sense, if you like. And then they stay at wedding photography and expand into portraiture and babies and all the other spin-offs, if you like, from weddings, if you consider those sort of things spin-offs. Um, whereas, you know, I, I started in photojournalism, uh, in news photography, uh, and then I moved into assisting in studios because I wanted a different direction. So assisting can go a long way to helping you learn. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, learn a lot about how the lighting techniques are done. But it's harder to get assisting jobs these days because, again, a lot of people want to do them. But most of the top photographers in the world have at some point assisted another top photographer and learnt their trade that way. Or, like many top pros, they've learnt their trade on carltaylereducation.com. So... Uh, <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it's a difficult one to answer. I would say go with your passion. At the end of the day, there's no point saying, oh, I'll, I'll, I'm going to shoot pots of vitamins all day long. If, if you're not interested. If you're not interested yeah. in it, you know. Go, what do you love about photography? What do you love shooting? And can you make that into a career? Um, if you said, oh, I love travel and culture, then obviously it's going to be harder to turn that into a career in yeah. photography than, than something else. I think if I could just add there as well is just have an open mind as well. Even if you've never tried something, it's worth having a go. If someone approaches you with a project, it's yep. worth being open saying maybe you've never photographed it before, but give it a go. You might find that that's what you really enjoy as, mm -hmm. as well. So for someone yeah. starting out. Yeah, true. Um, the next one is Steve-O1976. Hello to you both. I have a question for Ash. Are you a photographer yourself? Carl's name is on the door, but do you have any creative input in the day-to-day or input into the day-to-day -day images you all create as a team. Uh, first answer to that, am I a photographer? Yes, I studied photography, um, but I had no experience in studio photography. So You studied here, photography journalism, I didn't studied you? photojournalism, yes. Uh, so much more reportage style, um, on the fly, 
unposed but you kind did, of photography. You did work but as a photographer. I then also from there I went to the ships where I did a contract working as a ships photographer. So there I had some experience with studio lighting, but not and, I didn't and, understand and you the intricacies. Assisted as well before. I assisted a school photographer, yes. Right. Um, but that was all natural light as well. There was no flash there. Do I have any creative input? Yes. I argue with Carl when we do shoots, but that's as far as it would it she would go, win. I'd say. She never wins. <laughs> I didn't she, say I won, I just say I argued. <laughs> she argues occasionally or maybe now to be fair, I, I mean I do listen because one, no, one, one of the things you get when you're doing a in-depth lot a long-term product photography. As a matter of fact, we've just been working on a headphones um, shot, beats headphones shot behind us. Most of it's moved out the way now. Uh, and, and it wasn't you assisting. No, it wasn't. Uh, it was someone else assisting on that shoot. Um, and we get, you know, you're working with an assistant who's moving stuff around for you and setting up the lighting and helping you do what you need while you're looking through camera. Um, but it's nice to have some fresh eyes on it as well now and again, because someone will say, well, actually, I think that new contour light we just put there, maybe it'd be better if it was a mm -hmm. bit darker. Or so, you, so your input is often, I think that should be a bit brighter, or maybe yeah. that should just move a little. So there's little things like that, and then we'll. I'll, I'm, I'm certainly open to trying it, but yes. if I don't like mm -hmm. it, I'll say so, and it'll definitely. Go, yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. Um, one thing I would say, and this is something you do have to learn, if you are the photographer and you have got an assistant and you've got an assistant that wants to offer advice, that's fine, but don't feel you have to take it. Because some people, some photographers are just too polite. They think, oh, they, they suggested that, maybe I should go, oh, I'll never do that. Doesn't I just say, problem. I just say, no, <laughs> we ain't doing that because it looks crap. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> right. Um, next question is from Aquilino Paparo saying, hi Carl, what do you think of the X1D Mark II Hasselblad? Well, I haven't really seen it yet, I'm afraid, um, but we will see it, as I said, uh, when Chris brings it over, I'm gonna have a play with it. What I've seen on paper looks good. They all um, do on paper though. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's another 50 megapixel. Um, I thought there might have been a 100 megapixel coming. I, I didn't, don't know, but that's a bigger sense of the 100. They may have had to change the lens design a bit because of the slightly physical size. We don't know what else is coming. Um, we don't know what else Chris is going to bring. I'm very impressed with that new CFV back thing that you can put onto the older cameras. I think that's going to go down really well. You'll find out more on the 18th of July is all I can say. We'll answer your questions after that. <laughs> right, keep going. What uh, have we got? We, we do that, we're going to have to start the competition soon. I know, soon. we are. Uh, what, what time? You guys have got to go somewhere, haven't you? Yeah, what time in an have you hour. Got to, in an hour, yeah. you've got an hour max, yeah. right, okay. Well, right. an hour 15, right. and then we're running. Well, we, yeah, okay, let's go. We've got one from Chetan Marat. Hi Carl, I am doing photography for cookwares like KitchenAid. Can you give some tips for steel cookware? Oh no, that's funny because Georgie and I were actually about to photograph a project on steel <laughs> cookware as a new course test. Um, and it, it, it's complex stuff because it's round and it's shiny, it's chrome, so you need wrap around lighting uh, to envelop the product to avoid having reflections in there. You don't want it to become too flat though, your lighting. So you also want to sort of keep some directional lighting, even if you envelop it in light, you still gotta have some direction to that light coming through your enveloping wraparound material or whatever you're using. Sometimes we use acrylic, sometimes we use scrims, um, but we are gonna explore that as a new course because I thought it would make a great new course, but we haven't got around to filming yet, so I can't promise you it's gonna be out anytime soon, maybe in the next few months, but not yet. Um, we have got other shots that sit, uh, shoot similar, like the jewelry, isn't it? Jewelry. I think is we've identical. even got a chrome kettle. Oh on yeah, the we website. have got, we've got yeah, a chrome so kettle. Probably similar shoot that to we what did, yeah, and how, how we lit that and how we wrapped around, got the directional light. That's on carltaylereducation.com in the product section. Mm -hmm. We've got the jewelry rings one, which is a that's similar a very good one to technique. Watch. Mm -hmm. uh, some of that's on YouTube, but the whole thing is on, on Carl Taylor Education. But again, in our articles section on our website, um, you wrote uh, a really good blog post on it. So you go into articles here, you go into inspiration, and then you've got all these blog posts that actually, she just churns out these blog post after blog post after blog post. Those are live shows. I'm not even on the blog post page, am I? Uh, no, you are. Oh, I am, okay. Yeah. Well, I don't know where the rings the one's gone. Jewel the jewelry one is much further is it down. it further down? It's is a it? picture of the blue gemstone. Oh, there it is. No, that's focus, I have stacking. focus stacking. A few more down, there it is. There, okay, yeah. so you've got some great tips in yes. this jewellery blog post even. And this would be similar stuff that you need to know for 
uh, cookery ware, metal ware type much so. stuff. Yeah, similar, yeah, similar techniques. You could transfer those skills very easily. Yeah, I think so. Um, next one is from Abdul Azim. Hi, Carl. Do you ever take sunglasses or optical product shoots? Any tips on how to prevent reflection? <laughs> now, now, you know why I'm <laughs> laughing if he says, do, do you we ever? ever? <laughs> do we ever? We are renowned in the UK as probably the foremost optical glasses photographers and on my website, on my Squarespace website, carltaylor.com, you will see goodness knows how many shots from Kylie Minogue eyewear, Hugo Boss eyewear, red or dead. I still um, think it doesn't give the right idea of how much we photograph glasses. Yeah, <laughs> Karl Lagerfeld advertising there. Look at all these glasses shots. I shoot glasses all the time. I've been shooting glasses for 15 years at least. Uh, so the intricacies of shooting glasses, I could do it blindfolded, I reckon. We should try that one day. But the yeah. question is, any tips on how to prevent reflection of yourself on camera or glasses while taking the photos, or are you retouching Well, stuff we take the post? glass out the glasses, first of all. That's the first tip. If you look at these shots, you can see here, you could probably recognise that may not look like it's got glass in it. Um, it. It does look like it's got glass in it, just in that bit, but we put those back in in post-production. So actually... If you look at the most, like, so let's take this one, for example, there is no glass in that one. Now, that one might be obvious when you see it like that. But if we take, um, right, this one's got glass in, but it's not pointing directly. This had to have the glass in because it's got a pink tinted lens in it. Um, but in many instances, I'm trying to find one where it looks like it's got glass in, but it hasn't. Let me just see if I can find a good example. Um, there's, there should be something here that looks right. Yeah, so these here look like they've got glass in, um, but we're shooting straight down into the product there. But there's no glass. We put made it look like the lenses are in there by giving them a bit of a tint and a shine afterwards in post-production. And you have to be very careful where you position the camera and how you angle the glasses so that you don't pick up your own reflection in the glossy plastic. Mm -hmm. But we deal with and struggle with that all the time. Well, not struggle with it, but we just deal with yeah. it. Just t slight tweaks. Maybe there'll be a tiny little reflection of the camera mm -hmm. and you can't move the glasses. So we just fix that in post-production. Um, I would say with glasses, one of the key things with shooting glass as well, is understanding gradient lighting and understanding the inverse square law is absolutely key because you're dealing with these really small products. Um, I mean, there's a great example. They look like they got glass in those hill figure glasses. There's no glass in those. The glass in those lenses has been added in post-production. Okay, right, there so, we go. Is cool. that all of his question? That's all of his question. Right. Let's move on. Um, Ian Knight, is the water splash on products expected or a cliche now? Um, no, I, I think it's, it's, it depends if it's necessary. I mean, we often, we, we said this with the, some of the competition ones that we judged that we're going to announce soon, the winners. Sometimes you have to ask yourself why you're doing something. Why are you shooting that item? Why are you shooting it in that location or with that background? Does it marry up well? Does it work well? Does it express the product well. And I think as long as splash shots, the splash helps express the product, then it's, it's perfectly acceptable. As a matter of fact, it's, in many ways, it's a necessity. So if you take, for example, the Clinique stuff, it's, it's called clarifying lotion. It's called Moisture Surge is the name of the product. So that's perfectly applicable. Yeah and associated with that type of product. We take another one here, which is the uh, Chanel Sublimage product. You know, again, so a liquid splash can add some dynamics to it. But I know what you're saying, sometimes it's a bit of a cliche, you know, people are using liquid for the sake of using liquid. But we don't always use liquid. Here's, an, here's another one here that we use a different material on the, on the lipsticks there. Here we're using paint. Um, you know, it really does depend on whether or not enhances the product but I know what he's saying mm. sometimes it becomes overused but I think it's when they don't marry together you know someone puts a liquid splash on a banana or something or oh, maybe a banana is not because well, no, I think it is a good example why would you have a splash yeah, it, of a banana it's kind of really? like, is it relevant yeah. if it's relevant and it helps enhance the story then it's necessary next one is from 
Aditya Mankale saying, hello guys, Aditya from India. I just completed my BA in photography, which cost me around 20 to 22 grand. I'm what? Grand? Yeah. Blooming hell. I know. I'm planning to do- You should have gone on Carl Taylor Education for a year's membership would well, have cost you $168. Here you go, he's planning to do, they're planning to do their MA as well. So is it worth spending another 25 to 30 grand or even more? Is it never? No, it's not ever. No, I wouldn't say. Uh, it will cost you $168 or $330 for two years membership to Carl Taylor Education. You'll learn more there than you will on an MA degree on photography. And I can tell you that for a fact because I don't have a degree in photography. I can also tell you that some of the top photographers I know working in the industry in the UK also don't have a degree in photography. Some of them do, mm -hmm. but some of them don't. M many of them have a degree in design or other areas of different backgrounds, but photography, it doesn't kind of work like that. And I can also tell you that we have many university students that come on work experience with us after they've done their degree and we've got many comments where they say they've learned more with us in a week than they learned in a year. And then once they've been on our education platform, they learn more in that in a few months than they even could have possibly. Done. We have universities use our education platform to teach their students, okay? So what does that say? I think definitely, yeah. yeah so the, my honest answer is no, I wouldn't spend any more money. Concentrate on your work, your portfolio, building your skill set. Because sometimes the university degrees, in my opinion, they're all a bit arty and fluffy. You know, it's, it's, it's all about the feel. But that, that does not apply to the commercial realities of delivering images that clients need. I understand the, the need for a degree. Sometimes uh, in order to get a job, you need that piece of paper behind mm. your name. But once you, as you say, you've already got your first degree. Uh, so the best Thing would you are just to be get out I think and start it, start learning actually in a practical environment yeah. rather if it was than me and these this day I, I would say that I would probably prefer to do a degree in something else like um, computer generated imaging CGI yeah. 3d modeling mm -hmm. and then study photography separately so that you could get the degree but get a degree in something that is going to have more that's going to enhance your skill enhance set, your yeah. skill set or a degree in filmography you know videography mm -hmm. or something that could enhance your skill set but photography, I believe, can be taught better outside of university than, I'm going to have loads of universities calling me up and breathing down my neck <laughs> about this. But I'm sorry, I've got, you know, we run education. We've been in the education business for 10 years and I know I consult for some of the top photography brands on how to run education programs for them. So I, that's my opinion anyway. Next one is from Jay Watson Amper saying, um, Frequently clients want a lot done to a great standard in a short time at a cheap price. <laughs> we as photographers... Get rid of them. Get someone else. We as photographers know how much work goes into product photography. How do we explain to potential clients that great shots take time? Just do that. Explain to them that great shots take time. And uh, show them uh, even, you know, a lot of the time when I'm working, we have an art director in on the shoot. So they see how long it takes. They know what's involved. And if it's a good client, then they should appreciate it and understand the works that's involved. And a good way of doing it is to show them other shots you've done for other clients and explain how much they cost, how long they take, give them an idea of what goes into it. Video a few behind the scenes of you working on a shoot and all of the intricacies and so that you can present them with something so that they can understand it. But don't accept a client that says, oh no, you know, I want it a quarter of that price. And you know, you, what's the point of doing it if you're not gonna get paid the going rate? You know, you're not gonna go down to your dentist and haggle, <laughs> haggle quick, with them. Uh, you know, quick, yeah. cheap can job, thanks. I have thanks. a quick, cheaper <laughs> version than that um, dental work, please, or your doctor, or your local top chef restaurant, you know? No one else, you know, that's what it costs to do the job. And this is what annoys me a little bit in the photography industry is because so many people want to be photographers and it's got so competitive. So many of them are doing these ridiculous, like I'll work for free or I'll do it. Now it's okay to work for free in some senses that if you were to shoot a brand and do a speculative shot to send it to them to say, hey, do you like my work? Maybe use the, you can use this one for free if you come back to me. That can be a good way to get your foot in the door. But to continual, continually keep doing work for free for exposure and all that nonsense, I think it's ridiculous. Um, and um, yeah, you wouldn't get it in any other industry. I so. think in, in terms of um, explaining to them that it takes time, what you do, which seems to work as well, is you explain not 
that it's going to take time, but why it's going to take time. And once they understand what steps mm. you're going to be taking and they understand the work that has to go into it, mm. they're much more willing to accept that it can't be done in just an afternoon Absolutely. or something. Absolutely. And I mean, some shots can be quicker than others. You know, I mean, yeah. we look at these shots here. This Clinique one here it was a day and a half's work. That one there, I think I wrapped that up in a four hours, that one. Yeah. Um, and that one there wrapped up in a few hours as well. So it, it all depends on the complexity of the shot. Um, this one here didn't take long in terms of lighting, but it took you, following my finicky yeah. little pedantic movements and move that there, took us the best part of a day to get everything perfectly positioned and mm. changed. So it, it does depend on it, but I mean, there are some product shots, some sort of basic product shots. I, I could bash that wine shot out and. 20 minutes these days, you know, so it depends. Yes. Next one is from James Lavish, who's saying, Carl, I've taken many a class online and your program is simply amazing. The best in the world. Quick question. Why do you choose extenders rather than dedicated macro lenses for your product work? That's a good question. Very good question. And that is very simply answered that I use the Hasselblad medium format camera and even on the Canon or any of the other brands. Uh, my main lens that I use for product photography is 80 millimeter focal length. I also use a 100 millimeter. The Hasselblad macro lens is 120 millimeter and I find it puts me a bit too far away from my product. It doesn't feel quite intimate enough. I like to have a feeling of being reasonably close to the product. It makes the product feel more intimate, more powerful. So I choose a different focal length to the macro lens they have available and I get around that by using extension tube. I also can see no noticeable difference between my 80 mil prime lens or my 100 mil prime lens with an extension tube compared to the 120 mil macro, I can't see any quality difference, so that's why. Cool, Rudy Cronier is asking, what specifics need one look at in a good computer screen that is not in the upper price range? Well, you need a screen that you can calibrate, that says it can be calibrated. It has to display, you know, 98, 99% of the RGB, sRGB, Adobe RGB gamut, uh, so that it can actually display the colors because if it can't even display them, then it can't be profiled properly. There aren't many monitors, I'm afraid, though, that are cheap, that are good enough. You know, if you look at the very top brands, your ISO, your NEC, then we've got Asus that falls down sort of half price, but there's still, you know, a couple of thousand dollars for that monitor. Um, then you might have BenQ, I think is another one, but I don't know what they're like. So there are some, but unfortunately, it's the old to. get what you pay for, yeah. I'm afraid. Next one is from Andrea TAF147. Carl, I'm trying to become a food photographer. Lots of people interested in food today. Mm. I've got a full frame Canon. I've got a 100 mil macro lens, Good. Um, F2 and a 50 mil lens, F1.8. What's my next lens? Thank you. Well, the 100 mil is a very good lens. As a matter of fact, on our uh, food photography tutorials with Anna. Anna Pushtanakova, who's a food photographer and stylist, she uses a Canon 5D Mark II or three, and she uses a 100mm yeah. 2.8 macro lens for most of her work. And we actually shot a whole load of our courses on that 100mm lens. So it's a very good choice of lens. If you've got the 50, I'd like to have somewhere in between. I wouldn't go wider than 50, but I'd mm. maybe consider an 85mm prime. I'd think about an 85mm 1.4, which wouldn't cost you too much money, and maybe an extension tube, a, a narrow extension tube to go with it. And then that puts you, just gives you that focal length in between. And then that 85 mil 1.4 being a large maximum aperture, if you need to shoot those very shallow depth of field food shots that look, can look good on fresh strawberries and fruit and all that sort of stuff, that would be a good choice. Cool, next one is from Dr. Metal. Hi Carl, soon I'm going to be released from the army with some money on my side. I'm going to be in Germany for one month. Do you know any great locations to shoot? I live in Israel, so they're used to the desert. Um, no, I don't, I don't know Germany very well. Um, I've been to Cologne a few times for Photokina, but I've never really shot in Germany. I know they've got some really great forests in Germany, like big spooky forests that could be quite cool, that you get a lot of, sort of mist and stuff. So that might be worth looking into. They do obviously have some interesting architecture. Hamburg um, has some nice architecture. Hamburg, yeah. Mm. So I'm afraid that the, the answer is I don't really know. Um, so I wouldn't want to give any unnecessary advice that was wrong. I'd say you're going to have to get onto Google, Google. and start <laughs> looking that up. Um, 
The next one is from Caleb Kerr. Why did you stop your commercial photography business and transition into education? Did you get bored? I'm shooting professionally and love it, but I'm curious about your career trajectory. Uh, I didn't stop my commercial <laughs> photography. I uh, still do commercial photography. I've done commercial photography for 25 plus years. I've done photography for 30 years. First few years was photojournalism, then moved into assisting, then set up my own studio in 1997. And I've continued commercial photography ever since then. Uh, it just happens that the commercial photography clients that I work for now are pretty much the same ones I've worked for for many years. Um, and we do take occasional new different projects on, some interesting ones time, now and again. Um, it's just that we accidentally sort of fell into education because um, I got asked to run a few workshops and do a few presentations on photography and I quite enjoyed it and then I kind of hit on the idea and this was you know more than 10 years ago um, well let's maybe try doing a couple of um, educational things and they went really well I enjoyed imparting the knowledge I quite like expressing talking about photography and I'm talking I love talking yeah <laughs> I love talking but I do enjoy imparting knowledge yeah. as well i do actually like that process so I enjoyed that and then it just kind of grew from there we started off doing dvds and courses uh, and now we've got the whole education platform as a membership model but i still shoot commercially if as i said to ashley earlier or someone who asked a question if we if i wasn't doing the education business i would still be working as a commercial photographer but it would just be me and one assistant instead of the whole crew and team and we also wouldn't have a studio this big we've got like 380 square meters or 4000 square foot here my last studio was about 1200 square foot so i'd probably be working back in a studio that size if i was just doing mm -hmm. commercial photography next one is from Tanme Agarwal Hi Carl, I was doing wildlife photography, but it's very expensive. Now I would like mm. to move to product photography. How can I build that eye or creativity for product photography? Well, it's a very different discipline. I mean, you, if you're doing wildlife photography, you're dealing, dealing primarily with the moment and yeah. waiting and natural light and uh, researching your animal species and knowing where and when. Now with product photography, it's kind of similar. You need to research the product, look at the aesthetics, look at the qualities, understand form, shape, light. But product photography really is understanding light. It's knowing how to manipulate light to make something that's very boring looking look amazing. Um, you know, it, I mean, it really is. I mean, if you take this, this is a pen, right? That's a pen, okay? Now, I, I'm not even sure if I've got this shot on my website anymore. I, there yeah. it is. There's a pen. Now, if you can make a pen look good, then you kind of started to nail, go back to that shot then, you've start, kind of started to nail understanding lighting and understanding what's needed in lighting. The ability to shoot great product imagery is that ability to take something that's fairly mundane, like a couple of lipsticks, and then elevate them into something super majestical and important. And it's all about controlling and manipulating light. And that is the thing you've got to master for product photography. And um, it doesn't have to be too expensive because you can do it really well. I, I mean, I did one, I did a, it's on our Instagram account, isn't it? Um, I did a product shot the other day and um, I don't know if we're gonna see it that clearly on here, but I did this product shot here on the telly there it is there uh, can you see that right Ben's just brought our Instagram account up there now you might he's going to come and refocus the lens but I did that product shot on uh, one with one light okay so it is feasible to do good product photography with one light if you know what you're doing and you understand the process but it's understanding form it's understanding aesthetics and understanding the characteristics of what you need to show for product photography to uh, really make it work. So um, you can use some basic kit, but I mean, I use, you know, some shots, you, as you know, I use one light, two, three lights, but we've used 12 lights before, haven't we? Yeah. So, you know, there we go. Right, now, a um, few more questions, then I think we're gonna really need to look at this competition. Yes, okay. Jay or Gay, I don't know how you say your name, I'm afraid. Where, where, where? GE. Je Prado, I don't know. Ge that sounds Ge fancy. Je Prado sounds fancy, <laughs> I don't know. Do you have an agent or studio manager? Short question. 
Um, no. Well, I mean, I suppose Emma is somewhat studio manager yeah. and <laughs> organising everything and making sure everything goes well. Um, no, and I don't use an agent, although I know a lot of my photographer friends uh, in London that do use agents. Um, and obviously an agent takes a 20% cut, but an agent also will try to get you the best usage fees, get, you know, is fighting your corner. But some agents get lazy. Some agents have got several photographers on their books, a dozen photographers on their books. And, um, you know, they, they, they can get lazy. So it, it really depends. You have to go with what works for you. And if you think you can get the client work yourself, then you're going to not lose 20%. But if you're not good at your own marketing and management and all that sort of stuff, then maybe an agent is a better call for you. Bobby Donnell says, hello from Pittsburgh. Um, I have a studio in my home. Never a complaint about my work, but I lose a lot of potential clients because they go with a photographer with a storefront. Once they find out I work from home, mm. um, how can I market it so that it doesn't matter? Well, it's difficult because sometimes the client's got to come into your, your studio. I do know... Um, when I very first started doing my first product photography, I was doing it in my dining room um, just to, to learn stuff. But I did, as soon as I feasibly could, moved out of there into a very small studio space. Some photographers I know have got their studio attached to their home. It's like a double garage, decent sized building, and it's, it's just a dedicated studio space alongside their home. There's no problem with that. I don't see any client would have an issue with mm -hmm. that. That just makes common business sense to have you know a space there attached to your home but i think it has to be a dedicated space you know if it looks like it's your front living room convert it, it doesn't look yeah, very professional no, unfortunately um so if you don't have the option to have a dedicated space in your home or as a separate room or a outbuilding or double garage shed you know that type of thing then i think you've got to start looking for a, a location that you can rent uh, a reasonable price to, uh, to get started. It doesn't have to be much. I know some photographers that just rent um, communal halls on a day rate um, to you know, use the space, like church halls, mm -hmm. scout halls, or communal halls, use the electric, they take all the kit there. The problem is you've got to take all your kit there back and forth. Yeah. If you've got your own little hall space, you can leave all the stuff, all your props, your backgrounds and everything else. Start smallish. My first studio was tiny. Um, but I made it work, and then as my business expanded, moved to a to a bigger one. Um, you know, I, the only thing I can compare it to is like if you had a mechanic and he was fixing engines in his front room, you might think, you know what, I might go down to that mechanic that's got a proper garage. Yeah, you you might. It's just perception. But again, if his work is good, if his work's then good, it shouldn't, well, I mean, yeah. that's it. I mean, if the work is good, hopefully they would say, yeah, that's still good work. Yeah. But you know. This is a tough one. Next question is from Zhu Piang. Hi, sir. What is the difference between Broncolor softboxes and others? Not a huge amount, to be honest. Um, the build quality, I think, is good on the Broncolor softboxes. The way the light diffuses, make sure they've always got an internal diffuser. The cheapest softboxes attach onto your light and then they've just got a front diffuser, but the light does not spread out evenly. It's not homogenous. A softbox should be homogenous. That means that the light is even corner to corner across the thing. It's an even amount of light. So it needs good silver insides, good central diffusion that's at the right position, then a good cover. And the bronze ones even offer a third level of diffusion to give you even more homogeneity. Is that a word? Homogeneous? An even more homogeneous <laughs> light. There you go. Um, so build quality is also something, the ability to break it apart, pack it, put it together again, because a lot of these times you can't fit them in your car yeah. built. So you've got to break them down and reassemble them and how quick and how long and how many times you can do that before it falls apart. These are all things. I, I used Elinchrom lighting for many years and they make some pretty good soft boxes as well. Bronze color I, I use mostly because of their other modifiers, not their soft boxes, but they do build good soft boxes. And you can buy bronze color soft boxes to fit on other brands and yeah. lights as well. Next question is from Photo M. Hi Carl, has it happened to you to visualize a picture of an object or something? Make the setup, and after you have looked through the viewfinder, you didn't find that setup so interesting anymore? No, not anymore. Um, I so in the old days, yes, but I think now I'm much better 
at studying the aesthetics of what an object and its shape and what it has to offer and really considering carefully what is the beautiful part of it. And before I start any shoot, I will sit down with a cup of coffee and I'll explore the product. I'll look at its key attributes, its contours, its lines, its aesthetics. It's also what the client wants, you know, like the brand name, the logo, the, there's certain things that will be dictated to you by the client that you have to do anyway. But take that into consideration, then take the product and I really, I start thinking about, right, if it's got that shape there, then I'll be able to catch light on that edge and reveal that contour, and it goes in here. So I may put that bit into, and I start thinking about all of this and pre-visualizing this before I start shooting. And as you know, I usually sketch yes. a pretty crappy sketch out detailing, right, that light will come in from here. This will be here, that's gonna, and, and then that helps me further develop the idea before we even get the lights out. Mm -hmm. And then, then we get the lights out, we roll with it, and then sometimes it changes during the process because we notice something. But by and large, I set up a shot from an angle and it stays at that angle until we finish the shoot. And if things change, it's very minor changes. It won't yeah. be like we undo the whole thing and change the concept completely because it didn't look good. It will look good. Exactly. It might just need a few tweaks. Yeah. Uh, here Georgie and, there. and I were working on these uh, Beats headphone shots uh, yesterday and today, and we did make a change. We, we were shooting from low, and where we decided we couldn't see something quite right, so we went up a few inches, but that, but, that was it. Yeah. Next question is from Super Basic News. What do you think about using film for anything? Yeah, I think it's a great way, great learning tool. I started my career on film, used to shoot Kodachrome, Ektachrome, Fujichrome, Velvia, all of the main film stock in 35 mil all the way up to five by four. Shooting film disciplines you as a photographer and you learn more about photography because you have to get your exposure right. On transparency film, you've got to get your exposure right within a quarter to half an f-stop and um, you don't have any visual information there to show you whether or not you got it right. So you've got to learn stuff and it really is a great learning tool. So I, I would implore anyone to give shoot and film a go because uh, it makes you shoot more carefully, more slowly, because a film costs you money. Yeah. <laughs> it costs you money to shoot the film, buy the film, process the film. Digital's kind of throwaway. So what happens is you get that Pray and spray mentality. Yeah, you take one picture, check, or adjust, yeah, take another one. So, so as a discipline, shoot and film is a great way to learn. Um, Philippe Henao is saying, do you have any plan to offer commercial videography courses? We've got one already, haven't we? Um, we've got, we've got, how, to we've got, shoot got a, how to shoot video with a DSLR. It's more of a short filmmaking course, but it's on our website. I think it's in the advanced section on carltaylereducation.com. Um, we haven't done any more than that, although Ben keeps, Ben is an expert, awesomely skilled video editor. He keeps threatening that he might well make a video editing course at some point in the future. But we are so chock-a-block, our calendar <laughs> is so chock-a-block at the moment with either working overseas, traveling, workshops, filming, new courses, live shows, guests, we are just chocker at the moment, so it's not in our schedule at the moment for this year, but if there's a demand, like the CGI one was an unexpected one, computer modeling and CGI, we have started getting a lot of questions from our audience, especially product photographers, about you know wanting to understand CGI and how that was impacting product photography and consideration. So we got Victor Fayesh back in uh, and, and created a course on that. So we're always looking out for courses that our members want, basically, and, and we're trying to deliver that. So yeah, get in touch and let us know. Jeffrey Sidoris is saying, how do you feel? Hey, Jeffrey. <laughs> how do you feel about focus stacking for product photography? Do you tend to prefer it? Do you, or do you tend to prefer to get it in one? Well, getting it in one, um, if you're not doing focus stacking, would definitely involve, involve tilt and shift lenses, which which I do use. Uh, tilt and shift, well, I use the HDS 1.5 on the Hasselblad. It's not as versatile as using, a, say, a view camera like a, a Linoff Techno, where you've got more movement, more tilt and shift, but it's still good. However, there are some products that you just can't even get with tilt and shift because tilt and shift mm -hmm. is, you, you might have this plane that you need to, to cover, but then you might have another plane that goes nuts. So the depth of field just can't, you just can't accommodate it in tilt and shift. So there, focus stacking, 
can actually be beneficial. And to be honest, focus stacking has actually become a lot easier. I mean, I used to use some software called Helio, Heliocon or Helio Focus or something. Can't remember what it's called. But the one in Adobe now is actually very good. That's part of the Photoshop uh, program. In the recent jewelry courses on rings and stuff, we demonstrate, especially on small objects, you know, because you're in a macro. And obviously, depth of field is the, the main uh, component of affecting depth of field is aperture, mm -hmm. but the other thing's magnification. Yeah. So the more magnified you are, especially on jewelry, then depth of field diminishes dramatically. So focus stacking can be a big, uh, big asset on stuff like those rings that we did. Yeah. And as long as your subject is not moving, if it's fixed in position, your camera's fixed, focus stacking's a piece of cake, to be yeah, honest. Yeah, it know? just takes a bit more time. You know, I, I don't even do that precisely. I turn the lens a bit, turn the lens a bit, turn the lens a bit. Uh, one of the advantages, though, shooting tethered is I can move the focus from the, from the software yeah, rather than actually yeah. touching the lens. So that can help. So there's nothing wrong with focus stacking as long as you plan it carefully, your lighting is consistent on each exposure. This is another reason for having good lighting because if you're using a cheap brand of lighting and it's say a tenth of an f-stop out on each exposure, it's making your focus stacking harder because you get one exposure that's correct and then the next exposure is a bit darker then the next one might be a bit brighter. So obviously with the Bron gear we use here, every exposure we take is bang on exactly the same. So that makes the focus stacking process easier as well. So uh, yeah, no problem. If I can use tilt and shift, I will. If I can't, then focus stacking, no problem. Do you think they've been waiting long enough for the competition or do you want a few more questions? I think we're going to have to get on with it. So should we take three more questions and then we're going to announce the competition winners. Okay. And we're going to see who's won this amazing <laughs> Cirrus lighting <laughs> kit, this big stopper filter, these gel lighting packs, but the main prize there, two Cirrus lights in a lighting kit. Go for it, our three questions. Okay, Bob Brooks, hello from Texas. Carl, how did you get the jet black squares in the technical drawing shot? So the one you showed earlier. Um, well, it's not jet black square. Oh, I see, oh, I know, more. yeah, I know yeah. what he means. Right, okay. So what we used in that shot, as I often use, it's the same material that's actually the background in this shot. And um, it's, um, hang on, let me get here. Let me find it. There it is. Right, so that, that jet black square is the uh, matte acrylic. And it's sitting on gloss black acrylic. Now in America, acrylic is called macrolon. In Europe, it's called uh, perspex or acrylic. So uh, gloss black macrolon or acrylic or perspex, and you can also get it in a matte version. So that's the matte version. And I use the matte version in a lot of my product photos because it's, it's such a lovely silky finish. I mean, I used it in that, in that shot there with the hooks. I think you've used it in some of the food photos as well. Yeah, we've yeah. used it in food photo shoots as well. I use all sorts of different products and materials. That's matte black. Uh, acrylic or macrolon used as the background in that one as well. Uh, so that's what it's called, macrolon in America or acrylic or perspex. Um, Rodolfo Gargaro is saying, what are your thoughts on the new GFX 100 medium format? But you've kind of answered that one. Yeah, I answered already. it previously. And the fact is on paper, it looks great. Um, spec looks good. Obviously the new Hasselblad has come down in price than Mark II version. Um, I can't really say much about the Fuji because I've never held one and I've never shot with it. And I don't, it's like asking me, what do I think of this particular car if I've never driven it? I don't know. I can tell you what my car feels like to drive and what my last car, but I don't know any other car. Uh, on paper, the specs look good, it looks interesting. I'm not sure how big the sensor is, if it's as big as the one in the Hasselblad in the X1D. Certainly not as big as the one on my H6100, which has got a physically larger sensor, not just megapixels larger. Um, but I would implore anyone, before you make a purchasing decision on a 10 grand camera, go and rent one for a day. Rent two for a day and compare them both. That's what I would recommend you do. Um, Manish Casey, uh, what is mechanical shutter and digital shutter? Okay, mechanical shutter is when the, uh, the, the, the two shutter doors 
um, whether it's like a, a or a leaf shutter is when it's like an aperture that closes that's m mostly in medium format lenses so you have a set of blades that close down and open now that's the same for an aperture but in a leaf shutter that's it works like an aperture then you have um, the trap door mechanism which is in most SLR DSLR type cameras uh, it's a mechanical shutter uh, and then an, that lets the light through a gap for a specific period of time and that's called your shutter speed. So a 1 250th of a second means that the doors open and close 1 250th of a second. That's how much light got through. Uh, an electronic shutter doesn't need that. What that does is if you imagine the sensor, the actual physical sensor with all the pixels on the silicon material, it uses an electronic charge to expose the sensor and make it sensitive to light for just one 250 say so okay. it's almost like turning it on and off really yeah. quickly so it doesn't need a it just turns on and off so it only captures the light or accepts the photons to uh you know generate the elec the electricity electrical charge that creates the image it only does it on and off for that period so that's an electronic shutter compared to a man mechanical which is a trap door a door opening closing mechanism cool um Elodie Duto is saying, the best advice you can give for fashion photography? Uh, teamwork. That's the best advice. Uh, you need a, a super hot model who has no inhibitions in terms of she's happy to look gnarly, angry, jump, smiley. Uh, you get some models, and they look, they're almost too cool for school, you know? And those, they're not professional look, models. Yeah. They got one look, or they don't want to do this look because they don't think it works. If you work with a really good model, um, then you will get models that will give you any look you want. They'll give you, uh, they'll give you danger and, and sort of fear. They'll give you um, anger. They'll give you uh, whatever you need, you know. They'll give you the look that you want. And if you can work with, mo I mean, look there, there's Santa Rosina. Um, if, you know, they'll give you what you need. Okay, you tell them, you direct them, you need to work with them, you need to direct them with what you need, you need to make them believe in the images you're trying to create, you need to kind of almost sell the concept and the story to them, make them part of the team. And you need to do that with the whole team, the hairstylist, the makeup, the clothes stylist. And you know, it's like Daria Belakova, the fashion photographer who came in on our talk show. She often does these great big elaborate shoots and I said, how the hell do you pay? For all, she goes, oh no, I, get, I just get people. I just Facebook message people. Would you like to work with me on a shoot? I need a hairstylist. We'll just collaborate. And she gets all of these people to work together. She'll go to New York or wherever and she gets these people to work with her as a team. Now, sometimes she obviously pays them if it's a commercial shoot, but if it's just for a portfolio, she just works on teamwork, gets people involved that want to do a great shoot and make great images. So I think the key thing is conceptually you've got to have a great idea for a fashion shoot to work. You obviously got to have great clothes because that's what it's all about, fashion. You got to make sure that that fashion fits in with whatever background you're deciding to shoot it in, you know? Is it going to juxtapose well against it? But then teamwork is the essential thing. I find fashion shoots very stressful because for me, I deal with single products in a studio and I just boss people like you around, move that light, move that, do that, hold that reflector, and all of the control is I'm, in, I'm control freak master. The products don't talk back, Products do they? don't talk back, and I'm <laughs> control freak master. But in a fashion shoot, there's so many other elements, you know? Yeah. You've got the model, the model management, you've got hairstylists, makeup, everyone firing things, do you want this, do you want that? And you've got a crew of people watching, and then you've got to keep the whole thing together. And I love the buzz of it and the energy, but it's very draining, mm. very draining to manage it all and maintain it. Uh, which is why the top fashion photographers get paid so well. But when you when you put together a great team, then things just work so much better. And if you can communicate what you want to the team and get them on your side, that makes a huge, huge difference. Uh, last one, is it? The last question? Well, we, we still have quite a few. But well, I think be, we're going to have to stop there. It can be the and, last um, one. Or maybe we'll see if we come back to them. This, we'll, this is a quick one. Right. One digital eye photographer is saying, hi, where is your studio based and do you rent the space out? 
We do rent the space out. So we are based in uh, Guernsey in the Channel Islands, which is part of uh, Great Britain, the UK. And um, we are just a short hop away from London on the flight. So sometimes I work in London, sometimes I'm, I'm working in, in China uh, it, later in the year, in September. Uh, and whenever we're working overseas, we rent a studio. So you can rent studios in any city. It costs money to rent studios, um, but often your client or the project is paying for it. And we rent this studio out as well. So we have people rent the studio for filming purposes, for events, for commercial photography, for various stuff. <coughs> people have rented this to make music videos and stuff. So we've, we're fortunate enough to have a very large studio, but we're not in London paying London prices for it. So it's affordable for our business. And uh, I've, I've made my studio in my home where I'm from. Uh, not in my, this is not my house, I mean, in my this home a bigger, location. This is a big side yeah. part of your house. Um, but yeah, so yes and yes is, is the answer there, I guess. Right, that's it, isn't it? We need to, we're going to reveal the winners of the Carl Taylor competition, Carl Taylor education competition on... Beautiful Light. Beautiful Light. Let's take a look at um, the pictures. I, I've lost the folder now. What did I do with the folder? There, it there it is, there it is, right. Now, we had lots and lots of entries, as you can see here. Look at all this, look at all these entries, all right? Uh, I've shortlisted these pictures. I think it's 12. I'm going to bring these 12 up, uh, if I can remember how to do this. I think I'll bring these up as a slideshow. What am I doing? Oh, I'm pressing the wrong button. Uh, slideshow, 12 items. Let's bring up these and see if you can see them. There you are. There's our 12 shortlisted images. And they're shortlisted for different reasons, not because they're necessarily going to win or anything. Uh, some of these are going to win. Three of these are going to win. Well, I hope one, some of them are. <laughs> one of these is going to win first prize. And then two, second, there's going to be second and third. Um, but I shortlisted these to discuss a couple of things. So I'm going to run through them and discuss a few things. Now, this first one that I want to look at, this wasn't a, a, a particularly winning shot but I'm put it in the shortlist because this is a great example of uh, coloured lighting juxtaposing each other very well. This is red light on a particular colour of blue which is very effective at making something stand out and then you have the lighting of the traffic running down the bridge and the lights and the twilight in the sky and the reason this colour combination is, is, is very effective is actually, you'll see this, I used this myself, um, and you'll see exactly the same colour combination that's been done deliberately here, you see? It's exactly the same red and blue that juxtapose each other really, really well. So um, I, I thought that image was interesting from that point of view, but unfortunately, just to let you know, in case they were getting their hopes up, um, you're not in the short. You're not in the shortlist for the uh, for the winners on that, I'm afraid. But I just wanted to uh, congratulate you though on uh, on an interesting shot. What this doesn't tell us is, do you know the names of the, these people that I've shortlisted? I do have the Who names. Who is that, that one? Was you buy Bao. You buy Bao. Bao that Bao. shot there yeah. was right. This is uh, right. We're going to run through these. I'm, I'm going to start here because I don't want to announce or. or, or uh, tell you who the winner is yet. Let's start with this picture here. Who's this shot by? That one is by Adam Debeneditus. Deben yeah. Right, this is a good one, Adam. I like your use of lighting. I do like this underexposed look. A lot of people sometimes accuse me of my work looking underexposed, but actually I say to them, you know, go and get yourself a calibrated monitor and you'll see that it doesn't look as underexposed as you think. And it's a little bit similar in this one. It does look a little bit underexposed, but that adds to the mystery of the shot. And what's nice about the lighting in this is the contouring of the light and the way they've chosen to keep the mystery. And I like the pose. It's interesting to see a good male portrait like this. So I think it's, uh, it's well executed. So what was his name again? Adam Adam Deben Debenenditis, I think. So well done on that one, Adam. Uh, again, we don't know if you're the winner or not. We're going to announce the winners at the end. Who's this shot by? Alexandre Cusinier. Alexandre Cassinia. I thought this had a lovely feeling to the light, you know. Uh, as product photography goes, it's again, it's about invoking emotion with light. This does it really, really well, feels nice, got a nice mood to it. So 
I felt beautiful light came into this quite well. You've got the patches of light on the floor, the product surrounded by nice lighting, refraction of the light coming through the bottle into here, nice little glint of light off there. I felt the product looked like it was leaning over a bit. I felt the shot could have been rotated a bit because it looks, if you look at it, it looks a bit it looks a bit leaning over, it, doesn't it? Yeah, so I felt it could have been improved a little bit there, but well done on that shot. Uh, it does certainly fit in the beautiful light category. This next shot is by <laughs> Arta, <laughs> Arta Sajezek, I believe. And again, beautiful light, really nice feeling of light, the mist and the rays of light coming and breaking through those trees. Dappled light hitting the, the, the light at the edge of the pond or lake or whatever it is there. Got a really nice feel, almost feels a bit like Jurassic Park, you know, like a oh, I dinosaur. Don't know. I think it looks a lot more peaceful than oh, Jurassic really? Park. Really? I don't know, I can visualise a T-Rex coming, breaking out there. Um, I imagine so some ducks floating some along, ducks. sitting there with a Sunday picnic. <laughs> uh, now this is another, I really like this one with this tree shot, because it's very unusual, You've got this foggy mist coming over, which is giving this really weird ethereal you know, feeling to the light. Who's this This one? is by Christian Olivier or Olivier. Christian Olivier or Olivier. Uh, lovely feeling to the light, lovely perspective looking up at the trees. I love the strength and the balance of the shot and again the mystery and the feeling. So mm -hmm. I thought it was a beautiful, well executed shot that fitted the bill on beautiful light. This one. Craig Fleming. Craig Fleming. This is a beautiful shot as well. The light is all backlighting. Again, a lot of mystery. And it, re it reminds me of that sort of old 1970s David Bailey, P Patrick Litchfield style shots. I think obviously the film um, uh, sprockets and, and what have you add to it as well, give it that sort of mood. But even without that, it has an interesting feeling in an arty nude shot there without revealing too much, keeping it kind of, you know, mystery, mis, what's the word? Mysterious? Mysterious, that's it, keeping it. It's a good job you're here. Otherwise I wouldn't, <laughs> you're translator. I wouldn't have got that. Um, so, um, so well done on that. Who was that again? I forgot, Christian um, Olivier, was it? Yeah, Craig Chris, Fleming. Oh, Craig Fleming, sorry. Yes. So well done on that one, Craig. Uh, next one is by who? Dennis Lom. Den Dennis Lom. Lovely lighting here mm. falling through that path in the mountains, through the valley, through the passage there. Just that beautiful moment when light happened to blip between a break in the clouds and it created layering we in said the shot. Everyone, when the team looked at this picture, we all wanted to know what was around that bend. It exactly. really like drew you into yeah. the picture. It's got that lovely Hogarth line here, which mm. is this S curve that leads you into the shot and wraps you around. You, you're right. You want to know what is yeah. through there. What's that light calling what are you? Going you? To see? Yeah. So, so a lovely feeling to that shot. That was Dennis, Dennis Lom. Lom. Uh, who's this one? This by? one is by Ivan Morales Sapina, and this was actually a 454 second exposure 454 shot. 454 divided by 60 is how much? Oh no, I'm it's your about, translator, not your, about, your mathematician. About, about six, five or six minutes, I suppose. Ten minutes would be 600 seconds. That, yes. So, so 454 seconds, going to be around about six, five or six minutes or something. Um, and what he's done is, uh, I, I believe, a nighttime exposure here, and this looks like light pollution. Uh, hitting clouds that on a long exposure has created this sort of hazy diffusion and it gives again a very ethereal sort of light unusual quality um, what I felt though this shot compositionally wasn't working quite as strongly could have done with something in this area here but obviously on a 454 second exposure it would have had to have been still yeah. or, or solid but it, again in terms of beautiful light or certainly unusual light it ticks yeah ticks that box there. That was Ivan Morales Sapina. Yes. Next one is... Um, Jad Ward. Jad Ward. And uh, this is using natural, natural light, light coming yeah. through a window. You can actually see the window reflecting in the subject's glasses there, which I thought was really cool because you've got mm. the gleam of the sun, you can see a few white clouds and blue sky. Very simple, very clever, but nicely composed, really well done. So um, well done on that shot. I think a slightly different take on beautiful light as well, which was quite Yes, quite yeah, nice. yeah, it was interesting. This one, uh, you like animals, don't you? So I you do. love this yes. sort of stuff. This was by Lucas Gonzalez. Lucas Gonzalez. I mean, th you know, this is a bit chocolate boxy for me, a bit sort of like this is postcard type stuff, uh, calendar, but it is a beautiful shot because it does certainly feature be beautiful light, which is does, why yes. I, I certainly shortlisted it. Shallow depth of field, subject isolated well, rim lighting from the back lighting, all the, the, the foliage backlit really well. Got a nice feeling to it, nicely composed. So yes, well done there, Lucas, on beautiful light. 
Uh, who's this one? This one is Romeo Badali. Romeo Badale. Um, now, this is a, a fantastic shot uh, featuring a fantastic capture of a particular moment of the fisherman throwing his nets out. But look at how the light has caught that monofilament net and lit it up there with the water spray. But the other element about it is the water reflecting on the underside of this cave or whatever, wherever mm. the photographers stood. You've got all this dappled light reflecting off of the water, bouncing up. Little bit of translucency here as well in the fisherman's sarong or whatever it is he's wearing there. Plus the mist and the rays of light mm. coming down the back. So a lot going on in that one. Uh, this one. This one was by Vladimir Kosick. Vladimir Kosick. Now, I like this because it's really interesting light. You've got these layers of light. You're looking up the staircase and you can see three or four layers of staircases, floors going up there. And then you've got the subject looking at their mobile phone or iPad or whatever it is, glowing and lighting up their face. So I thought it was quite cleverly mm. done. I thought it was quite yeah, an so interesting, yeah. interesting take on it. So uh, well done. And we're back there. Right, now the big announce. Um, let's have a look at the big announce. We're going to go in uh, third place. Hold up third prize. There you go. Don't knock your water over <laughs> the computers. Third prize there goes go. to... Can they see it? I'm going to go here. Third prize goes to Jad Ward. Well done, Jad. We thought this was a fantastic take on Beautiful Light. Very interesting, unusual, a little bit different to some of the others. I like the dynamic of the diag diagonal lines. Jad, this is what you've won. We're going to get that off in the post to you. Congratulations. Um, let's take a look at some of the other ones. Second place. Second place wins this big stopper filter. Uh, a big stopper filter. Second place goes to Dennis Lom. Dennis Lom, well done. You've won a big stopper filter with that shot there. The whole team here. Now listen, I shortlist the images and I get them down, but the, the team of eight of us here, all visual people, uh, most of them more visual, well, they all went to uni, I didn't, so they got more <laughs> visual training than me. Uh, I'll make the final decision, but we normally come to similar yeah. decisions, don't we? Definitely, um, the same will be in the top. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right, now for the winner. The winner, dun, dun, dun. The winner is, dun, dun, You can't find dun, it. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. The winner is, this shot by Romeo, Romeo Badole. I thought this was a stunner in terms of beautiful light. Not only is it beautiful light, but it is a magnificent capture, a magnificent moment. Uh, many elements of beautiful light going on. The highlight, the bright highlight of the monofilament net, the water spray, the moment of throw, the capture, the light bouncing under the cliff, the rays of light, the light rippling off the water. It had multiple elements of beautiful mm -hmm. light in there. That was Romeo Badale. Romeo, you have won yourself a <laughs> brand new Cirrus, bronze colour Cirrus lighting kit. Uh, uh, the fantastic Cirrus lighting kit comes in its own kit, comes, I believe, with a couple of modifiers in there as well, worth several thousand dollars. So congratulations to you. We will be, well, we won't. Um, someone will be shipping Broncola. We'll be shipping that off to them. We'll be paying Broncola for that lighting kit uh, and for them to ship in it off or their dealer or wherever. I don't even know where, which country Romeo is in. Because no. as, as we know, our competitions are open to all our members worldwide. Yes. So it doesn't matter where you are, you can enter our competitions. So well done and congratulations to all of you guys who entered and uh, those that got shortlisted and obviously the uh, prize winners. I think we're going to take two more questions to wrap it up here. Two more questions and we're done. Okay, the next one is from Marco Viola. Hi, Carl. Question about jewellery photography. In the case of frontal photography, um, of an object with little diamonds or similar. I have the problem of the reflection of my camera inside the jewel. I tried to isolate the object with white paper to eliminate unwanted reflections, but the black reflection of the, lenses, of the lens still persists. Do you have some advice? Do I need I, to adjust I don't, in post-production? I'm, I'm not getting it because, you know, jewelry is so small that normally the, the, the reflection of the camera in the gemstones would not happen. I've, I, I've not, you know, the way gemstones, the facets on the gemstone, they're so multifaceted, diamond cut and the little ones, even loads of facets. So normally I just put a point light source on those to get a bit of sparkle out of those. You might get some problems on the plain metallic surfaces 
of a ring or of a, a, a necklace where you will get the camera reflected. But then you just got to move the jewelry at a slightly different angle to eliminate it. And, and it usually works. If it doesn't work then, then you use a huge white board, white foam board, cut a hole for the lens and you shoot through that. Mm -hmm. So you're predominantly shooting, you know, the reflection will be white and the only possible reflection of the camera will be the lens only because the rest of it is blanked behind a board and then you only have one black circle to retouch out. Shouldn't really be an issue. The next question is from a name. Unfortunately, I can't read. I don't know if it's Russian. Oh Something, yeah, it looks but, uh, like it's written in Russian. <laughs> I never, I, yeah, it's bizarre, isn't it? I don't know what that says, I'm afraid. No. What subjects in macro photography are most demanded by customers? Um, well, it would be, if it's demanded in a commercial sense, then macro goes into the realms of jewellery. Um, I mean, you can't really consider product photography, so perfumes, cosmetics, all of that stuff, Bigger. not really macro, mm. more like life-size sometimes with, I mean, okay, you could say, for example, uh, this one here this could be considered macro. That needed focus stacking. And that was like, that. they're obviously bigger than the real product. So when anything is one-to-one -one life size or bigger, then it is considered macro. So yes, sometimes. But mostly it's jewelry. Mm -hmm. Jewelry and watches and stuff is, is where macro becomes commercial. You know, photographs of insects and stuff like that isn't really a commercial activity uh, no. or flowers or that sort of stuff. Um, you know, it's obvious what commercial is commercial, is what people are trying to sell. Yeah. Um, Sanket Patil is saying, given the current scenario of some amount of product photography work, um, given the current scenario of some amount of product photography work is yeah. done using CGI, hmm. what genre of product photography will stay strong in the coming times, your views? Um, well, I think it's still arguable. I mean, like, if you go back to that shot there, that shot there could be CGI'd, but I think it still looks better as a photograph. And which one would take the longest to make and build and execute? Um, certainly as well, as soon as you've got any organic elements in the shot, you know, it would be much, it would be very hard to CGI that because the liquid yeah. elements, you just don't know what, you know, we, when we shot that, you remember we shot that and we moved, moved the liquid mm -hmm. many times and we got different results every time. So they, if you were CGI in it, you'd only get one result then you'd have to remodel it. And we as can, you mentioned, it didn't take too long didn't take either. Too long. So again, we probably yeah. could set up and light that quicker far than we could quicker. CGI yeah, it. Yeah, far quicker. So I think any shots in product photography where you have uh, an organic element, even potentially something like that, which not organic as such, but quicker and more versatile for me to do that in camera uh, than it is CGI. There are some... Uh, products that certainly may, you know, like a shot like that would be relatively easy to CGI, mm -hmm. especially if you have the model pre-built. But then, like some photographers we know, they're doing both. They're upskilling themselves now in CGI. We've got courses on CGI. They're upskilling themselves in CGI and doing photography. You know, like photographer David Lund um, yes. that we know. He does, he does, he works in both. He does CGI, 3D and uh, 3D stuff and photography and he, he inter combines those elements oh by the way david lund asked me to put out a shout for his instagram he's looking for more instagram <laughs> followers i don't even know what his instagram account is you take the next question while i look up his instagram account because he's got some good work david um let's just give okay. him okay the shout next out. one is a long one it's from dan webb david lund photography is his instagram account follow david he needs some more followers he does some great work and um yeah there you go. Cool. <laughs> Dan Webb is saying, I know this really annoys some pro uh, professional photographers, but most of my photography is actually TFP and personal collaborative projects. What's TFP? I was hoping you would know. Oh, is it, is it shots for prints or work for free or something like that, which annoys most other TFP, photographers? TFP, yeah. Is that what he means? I don't make any money at photography, so do it for the passion and love of it. Some photographers get mad at me because they feel I'm stealing clients that they could charge. But if the client never approaches them for their services, then am I really competing with them in the first place, your opinion? Yeah, I'm, I'm afraid I agree with them uh, to some extent. And the reason is that if someone, I don't know what business, let's say, what's his name? Uh, Dan Webb. Let's say, Dan, you own, a, let's say you do photography for free for, for people because you love it. But let's say you own a restaurant in town okay, and your business is restauranteering. Let's say someone who loves cooking opened a restaurant next door to yours, was doing a pretty good job on cooking, but they were just letting people eat for free. 
okay? That could be a problem for your business. And they could say, well, you know, I, I just love cooking for people. I love it, it's my passion. So I just run this pizza store here and I just, I just cook for free. Now that doesn't happen because they've got costs of materials and, and other things. So that means it's unlikely to happen. Whereas photographers, but photographers still have costs for materials, you know, rent, studio space, computers, storage, camera equipment, all the rest of it. Um, so in some ways I kind of sympathize with their point of view on this. Um, and I think maybe you've got to be careful with what you consider whether or not they would have ever paid a photographer for the stuff or whether they're taking advantage of you because they know you'll do it for free. And that's kind of that gray area. Uh, but for me, um, yeah, as a product photographer, I mean, I don't think it's gonna happen because anyone who was turning out product photography to a competent level, hopefully to where I'm shooting, you know, they're not going to be doing it for free. So no, it, I don't think they'd be spending you know, a day. So it, it depends what level you're shooting it at, Dan, and whether it really is competitive to other other people. Um, I know some wedding photographers that used to do weddings for really low prices, and they just used to enjoy doing weddings. Mm. Eventually, they got sick of it, so they stopped doing it. Um, maybe Dan will get sick of it. <laughs> <laughs> I think his competitors will hope so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's take a couple more questions, then we've got to call it quits, because you've got to go. Yeah, Randy Mass is saying, Hi, Carl, any tips on studio car photography? Thanks. Um, yeah, most studio car photography is actually done as CGI now. Uh, it's far easier to import the CGI model of the car, superimpose it into a background, create the, uh, the hemisphere, whatever it's called, that goes over all the lighting uh, values, the 32-bit values, and then map the reflections into the car. Uh, Victor demonstrated some of this on our CGI course. Um, car photography is difficult. If you're going to do actual car photography, which I've done before, you, you need a big space, you need a big cove like this. We're doing a live motorbike shoot, which is very similar we techniques are. coming later up in the year. later in the year. Uh, you need huge lighting panels, massive, big, huge panels that you can light into. Now, we did do a demonstration on car photography, doing it on the cheap. Um, as in like how you could do it, um, but do it, in, it with big pieces of foam board. Do, we did it in a warehouse because we didn't have a studio big enough at the time. Actually, I don't it's even know. It's all the way down. We, stu we do have it. Is it still here? Um, or is it in this one? There it there. is. So we shot this Carmen Gear, um, this classic car. Oh, and that uh, TVR as well. And we did these shoots and we show you how to do that type of car photography on the cheap, basically. And we've got a motorbike shoot coming up live later in the year. $19 a month, you get access not only to that shoot, but every other shoot we've ever done as a training course. It's all there, Carl Taylor Education, plus our live shows. Sign up for a month, check it out. You won't regret it. One more question, and we're done. Okay. Um one digital eye photography is saying, what would you say is the best way to get new clients for wedding and portrait photography? Um, well, that's a social photography, isn't it? Wedding and portrait is people, social. So I would imagine social media would play a big part in that. Word of mouth will play yeah. a big part in that. One thing I can tell you, the very clever social photographers, they keep very, very good databases. So if you imagine you had an engagement couple came through your door for some engagement photos, you shot their engagement, you better damn well get their name down and be shooting their wedding as well. Yeah. And then once they've had babies, you'll be shooting those kids' photos <laughs> the, too. Yep, the you'll newborn be shooting shoots, the family the shoot. You'll be shooting that family for the next 10, 15 years if you're astute with your business because you'll have their name down in the database. You'll send them a bottle of wine to congratulate them when they have their first kid or whatever. You will keep track of them. You'll stalk them when they <laughs> move house. You'll know, you'll update your database. You will periodically send out special Valentine offers, Easter offers, different things that are related to that social sphere of portraiture and Christmas and uh, marketing at Christmas for family portraits. Marketing, absolutely key in any business and keeping a good record and good database is absolutely key uh, to, con you know, your best client, your, you, most good successful businesses earn their money from repeat clients, yeah. repeat business. You look at my commercial photography, it's the same clients is, coming yeah, back over and over. you built those relationships. those relationships. There's no different with social photography. Uh, and then those people are your advertising platform. They're your word of mouth on social media. You do clever little things on social media where you say to one of your clients, hey, 
promote me and I'll enter you in a prize draw to win a such and such and blah, things like that. Just got to be a bit clever with it. Right, we're done. Congratulations again to our winners. Thank you to Broncolor for supporting us uh, with the uh, lighting kit. Uh, they don't give it away. We have to pay <laughs> for part of it, I'm afraid. Um, <laughs> Uh, thanks anyway. Thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring the show. Thanks to Lee Filters as well for a couple of these bits and bobs. Well done to our, all our winners. Thanks for watching us here on live social media. If you want to see the real live shows, where do they go? They go on carltaylereducation.com. carltaylereducation.com for the best live shows. Hopefully we'll see you over there too. Bye for now.